Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. They trusted her. Their families did, too. Now, a former nurse admits to being a serial killer. I told him that I was taking people's lives. The disturbing details revealed to police. The United States will withdraw. Donald Trump makes it official, pulling away from a huge climate change pact. Why, some say that's bad business. And the political situation in B.C. is fascinating and could have a huge impact on Ottawa. That issue and the new Conservative leader, both on the agenda for Andrew, Chantel and Paul Wells tonight. Plus, Rex is here. He'll have his thoughts on the B.C. story, too. She called it a red surge, the feeling that came over her when she was about to kill. That was just one of many chilling revelations in a video confession by former Ontario nurse Elizabeth Wetlofer. Today, she pleaded guilty to 14 charges, including the murder and attempted murder of seniors in nursing homes where she worked. Killed, she said, just because they were troublesome. John Lancaster has more on a harrowing day in court in Woodstock, Ontario. Her job was to care for the elderly and comfort the ill. But former nurse Elizabeth Wetlofer is now one of Canada's worst serial killers. Today, the 49-year-old admitted she was consumed with anger, taking it out on helpless patients like James Silcox. The Second World War vet was the first to die in 2007. Confused and restless, he apologized for his behavior moments before the nurse plunged a needle into his arm, sending a deadly dose of insulin coursing through his veins. I was devastated to hear that my father had those last words, you know, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was an absolute meltdown I had, you know, and uh, to know that, but uh, it's been really, really rough this morning. I pray to God I never, ever have to go through anything like this again in my life. In all, Wetlofer admitted killing eight patients, the last in 2014, and harming six more, all with insulin injections. Most of them lived at this care centre in Woodstock, Ontario. In a chilling confession to police, Wetlofer claimed they were annoying, stubborn, and some even wanted to die. She's uh, feisty. Was she? Yeah. She didn't hurt the nurses, right? And she's just very outspoken and feisty. And one night she said, you know, I'm going to die tonight. Mary said that? Yeah. And I said, oh. And she said, yeah, why don't you get me into the, why don't you get me into the deathbed so I can die? Helen Matheson was another victim. Annoyed because she kept crying out for help, Wetlofer served her a piece of her favorite blueberry cake, then stuck a needle in her arm, loading her with a lethal dose of insulin. In other cases, Wetlofer hugged and consoled the grieving family members, never once letting on she had killed their loved ones. She'll rot in a box for the rest of her life. And I'm happy to see her there because she doesn't deserve to breathe free, free air. Not after what she did and the way she did it. Wetlaw for oh, casually suggested police could learn something from her, that they could study her to learn more about what made her tick. Her crimes went unnoticed for years. Arpad Horvath's father was the last to die. She murdered eight people. I mean, <laughs> how is she going to help people? She murdered eight people. We're, what, are we going to study her like some goddamn dinosaur or something? Her crimes came to a close last summer. The breaking point, she said, when she was asked to care for diabetic school children in Ingersoll, Ontario. Wetlofer said she couldn't trust herself not to kill again. The victims' families will get their chance to confront Wetlawford directly when she's sentenced here later this month. She's facing life with no chance of parole for 25 years. But as one police officer noted today, this investigation was only sparked because of her confessions. She could have taken her secrets to the grave. John Lancaster, CBC News, Woodstock, Ontario. The case is prompting calls for a public inquiry into long-term care facilities right across the country. The eight people killed by Wetlawfer were all residents of two nursing homes, one in Woodstock, the other in London, Ontario. The five women and three men ranged in age from 75 to 96. Several groups, including the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, want to know why the system failed them. 
Critics say Donald Trump resigned today as leader of the free world. That by pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, he handed power to countries like China and India in the areas of green technology and jobs. Trump says he's protecting American jobs, coal mining, steelwork, the auto sector. But he wasn't even finished speaking before his global counterparts and business leaders denounced the move. Vicadopia has more. Donald Trump knows the value of the big reveal. Will he or won't he? In the end, he took a hard line. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. Speaking with the same America First fire of his campaign rallies, he quoted from a report supported by the coal and oil industries, claiming the Paris Agreement would cost the U.S. millions of jobs, and Trump says it's dignity. We don't want other leaders and other countries laughing at us anymore, and they won't be. They won't be. The U.S. had agreed to cut carbon emissions by a quarter before 2025 and pay $3 billion to help poor countries reach their targets. Trump says he's putting a stop payment on that to focus on creating jobs at home. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. The mayor of Pittsburgh immediately shot back. As the mayor of Pittsburgh, I can assure you that we will follow the guidelines of the Paris Agreement for our people, our economy and future. The president who signed the deal also issued a statement. Simply put, the private sector already chose a low carbon future. And Trump's most famous green industry ally announced he's jumping ship. Am departing presidential counsels, Elon Musk wrote, climate change is real. Leaving Paris is not good for America or the world, which was watching today. The world's biggest polluter reaffirmed its climate commitment, and so did the newest face on the world stage, taking a dig at Donald Trump. We all share the same responsibility. Make our planet great again. Trump insists he'll negotiate a better deal to stay in the agreement, but under the terms of the accord, formal withdrawal will take up to four years from the day it came into effect, which means the earliest the U.S. can exit is November 4th, 2020, a day after the next presidential election. Vicadopia, CBC News, Washington. Air pollution is one of the many causes of climate change. Smog can trap sunlight, cause warmer temperatures, and increase global warming. And today, a report on pollution in Canada lays out the cost to Canadians. It says smog alone cost the country about $36 billion in 2015 due to premature death and illness. And it put the number of those premature deaths at about 7,700. The Institute looked at years of scientific data on pollution, everything from smog to contaminated sites to pesticides. It looked at the costs to human health, business, and government. Justin Trudeau was among the world leaders Trump called after making his announcement. While the Prime Minister expressed disappointment, it's clear neither he nor innovative Canadians see Trump's move as a roadblock. Jacqueline Hansen has that part of the story. It took Toronto-based hydro store seven years to develop a new way to store energy, an alternative to batteries. The technology can convert any type of energy, including wind and solar, into air, then store it in underwater or underground pressure containers for later use. As we get better, there's export opportunities, and if the U.S. is, is slacking and not pushing that frontier, it allows uh, companies like us to step in. In the U.S., HydroStore wants to repurpose retired coal power plants and hire the former workers, a plan that HydroStore's CEO says is more realistic than Trump's. I don't see him bringing the coal miners back to work like he's promising. Uh, I think technologies like ours have a much better prospect of putting coal miners back to work. Canada has worked hard to get into the clean energy game. The government has been investing heavily, as have private funds. The sector now exports billions of dollars in clean energy technology, the vast majority of it sold to the U.S. 
Today's announcement won't necessarily cut off U.S. demand for Canadian exports. Washington doesn't control what states or private companies do. GE's CEO tweeted, Disappointed with today's decision on the Paris Agreement, climate change is real. Industry must now lead and not depend on government. Beyond the severe energy restrictions... Still, some experts say that targets set by federal governments for reducing emissions can make a difference. And it is still important for, uh, in all countries uh, that are looking to reduce their emissions, to have the right policy framework that would uh, essentially not allow uh, fossil fuels to be, uh, essentially have a free ride. Trump did an enormous favor for the American fossil fuel industry today, and his move is clearly not good for the fight against climate change. But the vast clean energy industry, which includes some of the largest companies in the U.S., launched years ago, and it will keep on going and growing in spite of Donald Trump. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Canadian softwood lumber workers and producers welcomed the government's aid package today. Five weeks ago, the U.S. slapped tariffs of up to 24 percent on Canadian exports, a move the industry said would cost jobs across this country. But it's not the end of the cross-border softwood dispute. And as Hannah Thibodeau tells us, it could get worse. Everyone in this small Quebec town has some link to the forest industry. When the Trump administration slapped tariffs on Canadian softwood in April, workers were worried about their jobs. It's estimated the industry will lose $700 million in exports and 2,200 jobs across the country in 2018 because of Trump's move. I love Canada, but they've outsmarted our politicians for many years, and you people understand that. So we did institute a very big tariff. Canada is standing up to the U.S., Today's aid package will provide $90 million to help workers worried about their future. To extend work-sharing opportunities to assist companies retain their employees and help affected workers upgrade their skills. Lumber factories like this one will have access to a $600 million fund in the form of loans and loan guarantees. And there's money to help find new markets overseas. If we can get some help to do that uh, up front, uh, then once we're established, it's no longer required. The minister in charge says coming up with this aid package was a balancing act. Any action has the potential of carrying uh, trade risk. We believe that we have been prudent. The prime minister discussed the issue with the U.S. president when they met last week. And the foreign affairs minister says a deal could come soon for a simple reason. We are seeing... Uh, real growth in house building in the United States and the American softwood lumber industry simply cannot meet all of the demand. The U.S. Lumber Coalition put out a press release calling the aid a subsidy. The Canadian Forest Products Association disagrees. What we're looking for really is, is, is ensuring that the government continues to support the legal fight. These duties are unwarranted without merit. The industry is bracing for another potential blow. The U.S. Commerce Department will rule on an anti-dumping claim against Canadian softwood producers. A finding for it could add 10 percent on top of the tariffs already in place. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. This is the last day of public hearings in Yukon, with the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. About 40 people spoke over three days in Whitehorse, twice as many as initially expected. Each witness talked about the loss of a loved one and the impact on their lives. Community hearings in other parts of the country won't be held until the fall. Hundreds of people took part in a community prayer walk in Thunder Bay, Ontario today to remember the lives of two Indigenous teenagers, 14-year-old Josiah Begg and 17-year-old Tammy Kiesch, were both found dead in a local river last month, the latest in a string of young Indigenous people to die in Thunder Bay waterways. The engineer who declared this Northern Ontario mall structurally sound just weeks before its collapse killed two people was found not guilty of criminal negligence today. A judge said, Robert Wood's actions were derelict and dishonest, but there was not enough evidence to convict him. For a second time this week, a hateful symbol from America's racist past 
has been found in a place that celebrates knowledge and diversity. A noose was found inside the recently opened National Museum of African American History and Culture. It drew outrage, but for some, exasperation and disappointment. There are people who, for whatever reason, can't seem to find a way to uh, live with their fellow human beings. And it's shocking that in 2017 that we still have this type of um, bigotry. Smithsonian employees responded today by gathering outside the museum in solidarity. Last Saturday, another noose was found hanging in another Smithsonian museum. In the 1800s and 1900s, thousands of black men and women were hanged, the target of lynch mobs. Straight ahead, cutting off kids and their time with touch screens. Why parents may need to do so as well. hair and all that it would have been a boring time. People would like here in the week and they would know it. they would not know what to do, where to go. When I dance I think about other people. Once you start remembering the people who you lost or once you start like thinking of them like that, you'll know how to dance. Just like that. My late best friend that committed suicide in 2015, Johnny Jr. Kidnap. He was my best friend for 15 years. I ran with him in the Terry Fox Marathon. Last time I saw him, I was proud of him. Never saw him again. The way I dance to the people who I dedicated to, it honors them. Once they see me dancing to them, they feel happy, respected, care, friendship. A terrifying scene has unfolded in the Philippine capital. Just after midnight, gunfire erupted and a fire broke out at a casino and resort in Manila. So far, there are no reports of death. All guests have left the building. We believe we know where all of our guests are, yes. At the moment, we only know of one suspect. Police say the shooter was trying to rob the resort, in contrast to reports that ISIS is claiming responsibility. That's particularly sensitive, given what else is happening. To the south, a military campaign is raining hell down on rebels allied with ISIS. Fierce gun battles in the streets of Marawi have shaken the city for 10 straight days. The military says ISIS is using human shields. More than 100 people are dead. Many more forced into evacuation centers, just part of the chaos in a region that's now under martial law. 
Quebec is handing the federal government a familiar headache. Premier Philippe Couillard wants to reopen talks about the Canadian Constitution. But maybe no surprise, Prime Minister Trudeau is already throwing cold water on the idea. Alison Northcott has the story. Quebec Premier Philippe Couillard says it's time to start a new conversation about Quebec's place in Canada. We're not moving in with conditions. We just say let's talk and let's understand each other better because we've drifted apart somewhat in the recent years. Quial says he's not asking for the Constitution to be reopened yet, but wants to start a cross-country dialogue to show Canadians why Quebec should be seen as a distinct society. What Quebec has always asked is not to be declared better or superior to the other provinces. It's just being recognized that because we have this special reality, we have special needs that need to be fulfilled. Donc, vont paraffer ce document. When the Constitution was repatriated in 1982, Quebec was the only province that refused to sign on. Later attempts to bring it on board failed. First, the Meech Lake Accord in 1987, then the Charlottetown Accord in 1992. Uh, these failures uh, are the reasons why the word Constitution has become taboo and uh, it's the reason why uh, no one really wants to touch that question and everyone fears that question. Cuillard is going down that road anyway, just in time for next year's provincial election. But Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was quick to say no to reopening constitutional talks. If he were to, other provinces and Indigenous groups could come to the table with their amendments. Still, NDP leader Tom Mulcair says it's time to solve a long-standing problem. And I think that Philippe Couillard is showing himself to be a bridge builder. And Justin Trudeau slamming the door on that for his own partisan, petty political gain. This analyst says Couillard is taking a political risk. The chances of success, as, we, as we've already seen, are low. And uh, the risks are that if it fails, again, it will be more ammunition for the sovereignty movement at a time when they're not doing very well. Couillard's plan has already caught the attention of Saskatchewan's Premier Brad Wall, who says if there are going to be constitutional discussions, he wants to talk about equalization payments, which he says benefit Quebec at the expense of his province. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. If you're a parent of young children, you've probably resorted to this before, handing over your tablet or smartphone to your little one for entertainment, just so you can get a few things done. A reality of our times. So today, the Canadian Pediatric Society issued new recommendations for screen time, both for kids and their parents. Christine Birak has the details. Let's face it, screens are everywhere, and kids like them a lot. I like to watch on the iPad, watch on the TV, and play on the TV. A mom of three and caregiver, Tina Turner does her best to keep everyone busy. But from the minute her kids wake up, they're asking to use one screen or another. I do worry about what it does to them uh, in terms of uh, psychological and mental, just what they're perceiving from on TV as opposed to reality. It takes you Parents to are constantly asking to doctors, how much is too much? What can I do? And what's the harm? There is emerging evidence of harm in young infants that use touch screens daily. We find that they are at increased risk of delayed sleep onset and other sleep problems. The Canadian Pediatric Society has released a new set of guidelines on screen time for children younger than five. In short, it recommends no screen time at all for kids under two. For ages two to five, no more than an hour a day. Plus, turn off background televisions and parents should lead by example. Model healthy use of screens. Turn off your screen when you're not using it. If you're at the park, you're at the park. You don't need to answer the email or the text right away. It's an expectation that they couldn't possibly meet. Pediatrician Dr. Dan Flanders says making parents feel guilty doesn't help. But he does agree, less is best. If we make a conscious effort to put the screens away at mealtimes, stop the screens an hour before bed, um, watch only television that is meaningful, uh, then that'll probably um, impact our children uh, in the most effective way. Back at the Turner household, they're working on it, but mom does sneak a peek here and there. I try not to do it, doesn't mean that I don't do it. <laughs> but sometimes a little screen time actually inspires playtime. 
Christine Virac, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. Coming up, for half a century, there's been an enduring mystery about one of the greatest albums ever recorded. It was a gift, a friendly gift. He didn't have to do it, but he wanted to say thank you to the Beatles. We explore the Canadian connection to Sgt. Pepper's. But first, your Thursday night lineup is just ahead. At Issue and Rex, they're only minutes away. First look at the day's business numbers. The TSX rose 120 points. No change to the dollar. In New York, the Dow hit a record high, gaining 135 points. The price of oil closed up 4 cents a barrel. A rapidly increasing number of experts and politicians are becoming progressively alarmed about air pollution. Most of the damage is caused by car pollution coming from the exhaust, and a bill has just been introduced in the Congress for a federal study of electric cars. The car uses no gas or oil, needs almost no maintenance, and creates no pollution or noise. Speed is a problem, though, for the car can only get up to 40 or 50 miles an hour. It doesn't look like much, but under its homemade plywood body is an efficient zinc air battery-powered electric motor. In its present experimental form, the car has a top speed of 73 miles per hour and a cruising range of more than 300 miles. It takes eight hours to recharge the battery from an ordinary household electrical outlet. The owner is 61-year-old Bill Ward. I asked him if he's had any approaches from manufacturers. Not genuine approaches, no. General Motors says it has made a breakthrough in the development of batteries to power the electric car of the future. Zinc nickel oxide batteries drive the car for 160 kilometers before they need recharging. That's twice as far as conventional battery power. The motorist simply plugs his car in overnight to build the power back up again. This type of electric car gets a top speed of 80 kilometers an hour and would cost about the same as a standard subcompact model. It may look like an ordinary Chrysler van on the outside, but it's a very different van on the inside. It uses an electrically powered sodium sulfur battery. The electric van was unveiled last week at Expo in Vancouver. Powerplex calculates that electricity for its battery costs about one and a half cents a kilometer, compared to five and a half cents for gasoline. It's becoming almost a ritual in the automotive industry now. A car company puts on a big PR show for its new electric car. Everyone says how wonderful electric cars are, and then they tell you that you can't buy one even if you wanted to, because it just doesn't make economic sense. Experts say improvements in technology will eventually make electric cars practical, but it's slow going, just like Vancouver traffic. There's gold fever on the streets of St. Paul. Everyone's talking about Briex, a small Calgary mining company that struck gold half a world away. And even though the mines are in Indonesia, a lot of the wealth is right here in St. Paul. So do you know any new millionaires? A few. Traders at the Alberta Stock Exchange say they've never seen anything like it. From a low of $1.90 to a high of $170 in just one year. Just five weeks ago, Briex's exploration chief predicted the mine could yield up to 200 million ounces of gold. But last week, the first signs of potential trouble. Briex geologist Michael de Guzman fell from a helicopter on a flight to the mining site. Some say it was suicide. Now the Indonesian government has put the project on hold after Briex revealed yesterday the size of the find may have been overstated. Wholesale panic today over the Briex affair. Canadians dumped the gold company's stock as fast as they could. Share prices crashed and Briex struggled in vain to stop the damage. All this after word the company's supposedly gigantic gold strike could be worthless. Security guards have been patrolling the building since early last night when the company released the independent audit by Strathcona Minerals, calling Briex the largest fraud in international mining history. Briex employees continued to work even as the world speculated about how such a massive salting scheme could have been carried out. The Wall Street Journal ran a front page story talking about a secret storage site where workers added mysterious powders to already crushed rock before sending it on to the assay labs. These are pictures of that alleged site. The sign says, if you have no business here, go away. Around 400 million in market capitalization has been lost in the first four minutes of trading. 
Morning, relax, ready, Jack's making That money's gone. Well, they used to call politics in B.C. wacky. It's settled down over time, but the latest election result has put it back front and centre in the national debate. An agreement between the NDP and the Greens likely means the end of the Christy Clark Liberal government. But it's complicated and could impact some major decisions in Ottawa. Chantel's in Montreal tonight, Andrew's here in Toronto, and Paul Wells is in Ottawa. But we're going to start tonight in Vancouver with our friend Shachi Curl, the executive director of the Angus Reid Institute. We asked her to give us the three things we need to know about the unfolding political drama in B.C. One, it's going to be all eyes on the B.C. legislature in the coming weeks. To recap, the Greens and the NDP have signed a four-year agreement to support each other. Meantime, B.C. Liberal Premier Christy Clark, and yes, she is still Premier, isn't quitting. She wants to test her government's confidence in the House, and that may well pave the way for that Green-NDP alliance, or it may not. There is a lot of procedural wrangling to come. The first thing is that the House needs to pick a speaker, and there are strategic reasons why all three parties may not be very keen to put one of their own members forward for that to happen. And if they don't, if the House can't come to an agreement, well, British Columbians could be going back to the polls. Two. Provided B.C. does get a functioning government, look for major implications on the national energy file. Following their voters, the NDP and Green leaders have said that they're going to do everything they can, including use the courts, to block the expansion and twinning of the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline. One province over in Alberta, this has left Premier Rachel Notley fuming, especially as Albertans, who are still trying to get back up on their feet economically, worry about how they're going to get their oil to market. So get ready for a big fight, one that puts Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in a very awkward position. Remember, he's burned a lot of political capital by saying yes to this project. And so far, he's doubled down, saying it will go ahead and he continues to support it. But we have seen in cases where Trudeau has backed away from politically unpopular decisions. Remember that deadline on refugee resettlement that was moved? Or remember that promise, one that he was very stringent on about electoral reform, one that ended up being broken. Three, speaking of electoral reform, it may well be Victoria, not Ottawa, that leads the way in how voters elect their governments. Green leader Andrew Weaver has been explicit in saying he wants British Columbia to be the test case to show that multi-party governments can work. But what kind of system, what kind of reform will British Columbians have a say? The answer is yes, by way of a referendum next year, provided the alliance holds. Which brings us all back to the coming weeks. Keep your eyes trained west, folks. This thing has more layers than an onion, and I'll be watching as they get peeled back one by one. All right, Shachi, thanks very much. There, there's lots there for us to chew on in terms of national implications, and especially for, for Justin Trudeau. Uh, Andrew, where do you start on that? Well, before we get to the national implications, there is still this matter of uh, how does this actually get resolved in B.C. Saatchi laid out very well the particular issue about this, the speaker and the impasse that could be result there and possible elections that can come from that. But even if they can get past that, a, a government in which you have two sides that essentially have the same number of seats with the speaker to break ties, that is not a stable situation. That is not a government that is going to be able to make large decisions. The speaker, for example, is not supposed to vote to make those kinds of changes. He's supposed to vote in favor of the status quo if he has to break a tie. Uh, so it's an inherently unstable situation. And I, can see, I think you can see that in the way that Christy Clark is playing her cards, that even if she does get defeated in the short term, it doesn't necessarily mean that this fabled four-year agreement is going to take, take uh, any effect. So all of that still has to be worked through before we get on to this question of what does it mean in terms of the, the, uh, the Kinder Morgan file, what does it mean in terms of the proportional representation, et cetera. Well, let's move it to Kinder Morgan first. <laughs> <laughs> Chantel, I mean, is it, should we assume it's dead or what? 
that would be premature, but uh, if you take away all this procedural stuff, you are still left with some uh, stark political realities. And one of those is that the vast majority, a significant majority of BC voters, mostly located in areas where the federal liberals have seat, voted for parties that do not want Kinder Morgan to go through. These are people who voted most likely for Justin Trudeau in the last election. So that's the politics of it, regardless of the outcome. Whoever gets to run this legislature in Victoria is not going to want to die on a hill defending Kinder Morgan. I'm speaking here of Premier Clark. Why would she? This is where she lost her seats on ground zero of the pipeline debate. So at the end of the day, net result, the opponents to the pipeline have been uh, emboldened, to say the least, uh, and the federal government, uh, who taught they had kind of a tentative path forward, cannot take that for granted anymore. Nothing good in this uh, situation for Justin Trudeau, uh, Paul. Well, I mean, I'm not so sure. He gets to um, <clears throat> demonstrate through uh, through uh, a purifying sacrifice that he means it when he's when he's on Rachel Notley's side of this fight. That'll probably make him a little bit more popular, not only in Alberta but in in uh, in, in uh, different resource-producing regions of the country. And I don't think he's. I don't think there's a huge cost to be paid uh, in British Columbia for pursuing with the line that he has already announced and is known in British Columbia that he supports this pipeline. Um, uh, my understanding is that the federal government's ability to write, the federal government's power to uh, approve this pipeline is, uh, is uh, not subject to provincial second guessing. Lord knows in this country a court might decide differently, but then uh, Trudeau would have someone to blame uh, and, 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 and it would be sort of out of his hands. Well, you do wonder though, does he really need an ugly fight that could end up in the courts with, with a province on, on an issue like a pipeline? Andy? Well, British Columbia opinion is divided. There's certainly, you would say, a majority might be against it, but it doesn't mean the, the unanimous by any means. Uh, and while we're all talking about how hot opinion is in BC, there's equally hot opinion in Alberta on this. If Albertans are going to be told, sorry, no, we're not a country, we're not an economic union, uh, you're not, we're not guaranteeing the free flow of goods uh, through, the, through the whole of Canada, we don't have a, a federal government that's supposed to protect uh, you know, the jurisdiction that crosses inter interprovincial boundaries. If all of that is told to Alberta, you're, you're just basically landlocked, there's going to be hell to pay in Alberta. Conversely, if, the, if there is a big fight, and if Trudeau digs in his heels, and if he gets the thing built, that is potentially realigning in terms of how Albertans and Saskatchewan voters look at the Liberals. They have traditionally, you know, for, for 50, 60 years, not been terribly interested in the Liberals. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that can get people to look at them in a very different way. Chantal? Um, yeah, yes, but but maybe the fact is that you don't need unanimity to be against a, a pipeline. You need to look at where the people who are against it are located. Uh, and you do have MPs, 17 of them in that caucus, too many of them in the Liberal caucus federally are located in areas where people do not want the pipeline. Uh, B, I'm not so sure that uh, Trudeau is willing to trade possible interests in Saskatchewan and Alberta for actual seats uh, in BC. And, and three, it's not just the courts that can get in the way of uh, Trudeau's approval of this pipeline. It's also the provincial government by refusing provincial permits or the municipal permits for all kinds of things that are related to the expansion of the pipeline. So it's a lot more complicated than just going to court and landing on a bad judge uh, from the federal perspective. All right, I want to uh, move it to the other uh one of the other big stories of the week, but it's certainly the week started with the new leader of the Conservative Party. Uh, here's how, here's what he said to his caucus uh, on Monday. We're the party of everyday Canadians who work hard, who make sacrifices to secure a better future for their kids. That's who we are. That's who we fight for. We're never going to change. The Liberals can take their cues from the cocktail circuit. We will take ours from the minivans, from the soccer fields, the Legion halls, and the grocery stores. Andrew Scheer, the new leader of the Conservative Party. Uh, Paul, you wrote a big piece in, uh, that just come out in, in, in McLean's, and analyzing that decision last week. We've all had this opportunity now, it's been almost a week, uh, thinking about what happened there and, and the implications of it. What is your overall take on what happened last week and why it matters? Uh, 
Andrew Shear is a nice guy, and uh, and that counted for more than a little in this race because the Conservative Party was due for one. Um, but uh, he also won essentially by pay, playing rope a dope for more than a decade as uh, deputy speaker and then as speaker of the House of Commons, uh, ostentatiously nonpartisan, and then uh, by being careful not to make enemies in a long, year long leadership race in which a bunch of his colleagues weren't as careful. So in the end, when it came down to a choice between Max Bernier and somebody else, he was the somebody. The test for, uh, and, and being nice means he'll be a, a, a tougher target than Bernier would have been to attack. Uh, he will uh, be incongruously appealing compared to some of the ways the Liberals are going to try to frame him. The test is whether he can be bold. The question is whether he can be bold. Stephen Harper came to power by proposing a GST cut that every economist in the country said was nutty and that had no history in, in, in conservative lore. Uh, Justin Trudeau came to power in part through, through proposing a return to deficits when, again, the conventional wisdom said that wasn't very smart. It's not clear whether, whether um, uh, Andrew Scheer has that kind of uh, hairpin turns it built into his psyche. He's never really had a chance to demonstrate that. The other way those two came to power was a throw the bums out attitude on the part of the public for the party in power at that time. And and the question will be, will that exist next time round uh, with Trudeau versus Scheer? Um, Chantel, your, uh, your take on this? It's also uh, in the case of Stephen Harper that it took him two elections uh, at the tail end of a, a decade of liberal rule and in the case of Justin Trudeau that he didn't need to be introduced or framed by uh, the other parties because a lot of Canadians felt that they knew who he was. Uh, Andrew Scheer's first challenge I think is going to have to be to introduce himself to Canadians and the longer he takes uh, to do that the more the other parties will get a chance to frame who he is to Canadians. And because he is a blank slate, you look at the numbers, I mean, 85% uh, in Quebec, 80% in Ontario have no idea really who he is. The, the, the longer he takes to make an impression, the more they will get to define it for him. You know, uh, the Liberals, like a lot of other people, thought uh, Bernier was going to win. They had all those buttons and uh, various other things printed up to... Uh, uh, to uh, showcase at the convention and also kind of pass around the country. Andrew, should the Liberals be worried about Andrew Scheer? Um, potentially. It's hard to say at this point, but he was, I think, probably the the least risky choice. He was he has, I think, less upside than, than uh, Bernier might have had, but less downside as well. So we're going to have to see how that develops. But he's at the helm, I think, of a very different party in many ways than in the, in the past. We, we looked at that 51-49 vote, and it's easy to say, well, the party is split, and think of it in sort of binary terms as sort of a pro-Harper, anti-Harper type of vote. I think it's much more complicated than that. Scheer would not have won if he was just the steady as she goes moderate candidate, and he wouldn't have won if he was just the social conservative candidate. He was the guy who could kind of straddle that divide. But those are two very different camps. And I think what we're going to see is Harper kind of bestrode that party as its first leader and, and you know, squashed all kinds of internal dissent or differing expressions of opinion. But we just had this long race where all the different factions within the party got to strut their stuff. Bernier leading, of course, the free market faction, getting 49 percent of the vote from, from various sources, uh, but also the SOCONs, also the progressive conservatives. Uh, I don't think it's going to be as easy for him to kind of just put all that back into the can now. I think he's going to have be a much more traditional leader who has to kind of work between these different factions uh, rather than just simply squashing them with an iron fist. And Harper had an advantage that he won't have, and it was that Quebec was voting for parties in opposition. At this point, they're back in the liberal fold, and unless he can compete with Trudeau in Quebec, it's going to be very hard to replicate that 2011 conservative majority without Quebec, because the Quebec is not going back to the bloc. And I think the next leader of the NDP won't have as much traction here as Thomas Mulcair had. All right, Paul, you get the last word. I've got 30 seconds left. The biggest challenge facing Sheer? Surviving probable defeat. Uh, uh, the other guys are right. Uh, th there have been two prime ministers in history who got elected uh, with a majority on their first try and then defeated the next time out. Alexander McKenzie and R.B. Bennett. And incidentally, both of them were defeated by the PM that they had 
replaced. Uh, Sir John A. Macdonald came back to whack McKenzie, and, and Mackenzie King came back to beat Bennett. Uh, Andrew Shear is going to try and do the impossible, which is to beat a Trudeau on, uh, on that Trudeau's second turn at bat. Um, what he needs, to, he, he can't say that he's preparing for defeat, but he needs conservatives to say to themselves, don't get too frisky. This might be a decade-long enterprise. All right. We'll leave it at that. Great to have you with us again, Paul. Thank you. Chantel in Montreal, Andrew here in Toronto. Well, Rex is coming up. Stay with us. Under the instruction of the Bank of Canada, two Ottawa firms do most of the processing of currency. Two years ago, it was decided to bring out Canadian Elizabethan dollars. The product of the work that began then will be seen this week when the new bills come into use. Open here to give to the tellers. The new bills look a little strange at first. A more mature Queen Elizabeth is on the front. Robins claim territory on the back. The bills are more detailed, more colorful. The bold numbers make it easier for visually impaired people to use. But visually, they don't appeal to everyone. I don't like them. It's ugly. That's why should we change? Canada's new $1 coins came tumbling off the mint's money presses today, and some people are already calling them loonies. They're made of nickel, copper, and recycled old tin cans. They're gold-colored, and they have 11 sides. Last fall, a courier service lost the original design of a voyageur, so it was switched to a loon swimming on a lake. It's coming, the latest addition to Canada's coin collection. Here's a sample token of the new bimetal coin, nickel on the outside with an aluminum bronze center. Now all they have to figure out is what design to put in the middle. There's no shortage of ideas. At the Canadian Mint, there are 19,000 of them. This design embodies the strength and the determination of Canadians from coast to coast. The new bills are smooth, almost slick, with clear windows and they won't care easily. I told you. There's a great future, the Bank of Canada says, in bills that feel like plastic. These new banknotes are a 21st century achievement in which all Canadians can take pride and in which all Canadians can place their confidence. When the banks open this week, you'll find the latest symbol of Canada's age of development, the new Canadian dollar. The linchpin of the agreement between Andrew Weaver and the NDP of BC is the determination that the Kinder Morgan pipeline from Alberta will not run through BC. That's its heart. So the agreement has massive implications not just for British Columbia, but the neighbour province of Alberta as well. It puts Premier Notley in the worst mind. Ms. Notley, let's give her full credit, has done as much as anyone could to make green respectable in a province hard to sell on that color. In an oil downturn, she introduced a carbon dioxide emission tax. 
She accepted the, to my mind, dubious and nebulous concept of social license and set out earnestly to earn it. In seeking a chance for Alberta's hurting oil industry to recover, Ms. Notley went much more than halfway to meet its fiercest critics. She is one who listens to Greens and legislates for the environment. For Ms. Notley's government to be any greener, it would have to be a tree, watered daily by David Suzuki and fertilized by the press releases of Elizabeth May. But after Tuesday, where has it got her? Well, from the substance and tone, and what a tone, of the kingmaker Andrew Weaver's remarks, my assessment is somewhere short of nowhere at all. The core sentiment of Mr. Weaver's support of the soon-to-be NDP Premier of BC is the binding, preeminent commitment to, quote, kill the Kinder Morgan pipeline, to consult it out of existence if necessary, to play with permits and municipal rulings, court challenges, and protest, till Trans Mountain suffocates from delay or expires from regulatory exhaustion. So, all Ms. Notley's honest efforts against the tide of majority opinion in her own province to earn social license have come to nothing. To Mr. Weaver, they're less than that proverbial mound of ill nutrition, a hill of beans. Where does that leave the Premier? If BC's soon-to-be government is consummately determined that no new pipelines from Alberta, will Ms. Notley, for example, keep the carbon tax? Why should she, would be my question, since it so singularly makes no impression at all on those actors it was solely and primarily intended to impress. What does this mean for Alberta-BC relations? The haughtiness of Mr. Weaver's dismissal has already soured great swaths of Alberta. It is not unlikely things will get better in the next while. It is impossible. The government-to-be's adamant rejection of Kinder Morgan Pipeline will be a capstone blister on an already deep wound. The deal has done two things, in my view. First, emptied social license of all substantial meaning, save that of being a camouflage under which to drag out opposition to a given project till it dies from pure procrastination and obstruction. And it places Prime Minister Trudeau in this 150 year of our great Canadian harmony in the center of the most intractable effort of political diplomacy he will ever see. The Weaver-Horgan Pact puts both Ms. Notley and Mr. Trudeau in a very hard, cold place. For The National, I'm Rex Murphy. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, the UN fired her as honorary ambassador for being too sexy and too violent. But Wonder Woman is making a cultural impact on Hollywood's big screen. That story on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. They have never seen anything like it around the Lincoln Memorial or for that matter anywhere else here in the capital of the United States. We lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time. This park area on the Washington Mall, right underneath the Capitol Dome, has been the gathering place for many demonstrations. But none quite so strange as this collection of uniformed veterans, complete with medals and toy machine guns. The anti-war movement in this country is an ever-changing phenomenon. You never know quite what to expect next. William H. Carroll from Atlanta, Georgia. 26 air medals and all the other stuff that goes with it. Washington was the scene today of the largest anti-nuclear demonstration ever held in the U.S. If you're not building for the future, you're stealing from it. They call the Supreme Court decision a tragic mistake. And on this, the 10th anniversary of legalized abortions, 26,000 marchers vowed to begin a second decade of protest. Organizers are calling it the biggest pro-choice rally in history. We will never give up. We will never give up. We will never give in. We will never give in. From Canada.
Capitol Hill to the Washington Monument, they formed an awesome mass of people. Not the million and a half the organizers claimed, but the largest ever gathering of black Americans. We are not here to tear down America. America is tearing itself down. We are here to rebuild the wasted cities. This was exactly the image organizers wanted, a pageant of Americans before a national icon. Summoned by a political commentator and a champion of conservatives. This day is a day that we can start the heart of America again. Look around you, you're not alone. You are Americans. The National. The National. Tonight. When Calls the Heart. New season begins Sunday, June 18th on CBC. Your lake is said to be saltier than the ocean. The only place saltier is the Dead Sea itself and the armpits of Orville Redenbach. Johnny Harris returns with Still Standing. The new season begins Tuesday, June 27th on CBC. You can have this for your next disco party. The iconic dance floor from Saturday Night Fever is going up for auction this month. Built for the 1977 movie, the floor lit up like a box of crayons as John Travolta busted a move. The Los Angeles Auction House expects it to sell for more than a million dollars US. And this piece of music history fetched $3 million last night at an auction in Brooklyn. It's one of the guitars strummed by Jerry Garcia, the late frontman of the Grateful Dead. He called it Wolf. It was bought by a longtime fan. And still on the subject of music history, chances are you own it or know someone who does. The record often described as the most important rock album in rock and roll ever made was released 50 years ago today. You might think there's nothing new to say about the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Well, how about its Canadian connections? Here's Stephanie Van Campen. It was an album that redefined popular music and the Beatles as a band, a musical experiment no one had ever heard before. Not just a series of catchy tunes, but a concept album following one theme. The cover art made almost as much of a splash as the songs, colorful and fanciful, revealing a Canadian connection. An Ontario Provincial Police badge, the same one worn by officers today, sewn onto Paul McCartney's jacket. I think it's a nod to Canadian Beatles fans, and there were so many hundreds of thousands of Canadian Beatles fans in the 60s, and any one of them could have sent Paul McCartney the badge. And plenty have made the claim. The Beatles came to Canada three times, but it was the first visit in 1964 that offered OPP officer Corporal Glenn Hickingbottom a chance to meet the Fab Four. He worked security for the band and apparently gave them four OPP badges. Three years later, an OPP badge showed up on the now iconic album. It was a gift. A friendly gift. He didn't have to do it, but he wanted to say thank you to the Beatles because he had two kids, a son and a daughter. They were both Beatles fans. There are other stories, too, about the real-life Sergeant Pepper, supposedly Canadian OPP officer Sergeant Randall Pepper, who also worked security for the Beatles during a Toronto visit. But when the album bearing his name came out a few years later, his granddaughter says he wasn't impressed. He didn't think too much. Of course, my mother and my uncle thought it was fantastic, but my grandmother and my grandfather just kind of poo-pooed it and just thought it was, it was kind of silly. 
<laughs> McCartney's own version of the story is different. In an interview, he said he misheard someone say salt and pepper as Sergeant Pepper, and it stuck. Whatever the truth, it doesn't diminish the impact of a beloved album still delighting and mystifying fans 50 years on. Stephanie Van Campen, CBC News, Toronto. Great story. Never heard that stuff. That's The National for this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.